average American now carries 23 extra pounds. Heart disease and stroke will claim the lives of 460,000 American women. 69 grams of fat. You could actually save 12 grams of the fat and half the calories if you simply ate an entire stick of butter. We're talking about diabetes and hypertension and bone diseases, osteoporosis. Prostate cancer is now the most common cancer in American men. Doctors say we really need to eat less red and processed meat. On arteriosclerosis and cancer and autoimmune disease. We have unprecedented amount of type 2 diabetes in our children and we're starting to see hypertension in our children in grammar school. In case you're wondering, 2,120 calories. Clearly the Western diet is taking a toll. This should serve as a wake-up call. We have a growing problem and the ones who are growing are us. Food. It's central to our lives and traditions. Every special occasion seems to involve food and feasting. But could some of these same foods, including several that we think are good for our health, also be causing many of our most serious health problems? Indeed, we're facing a massive health crisis. No less than 40% of Americans today are obese. And about half of us are taking some form of prescription drug. The best-known statin drug, Lipitor, is the most prescribed drug ever in the world. Almost one in five American four-year-olds are now considered to be obese. Though Mexican-American and African-American children are still more likely to be overweight. This could be the first generation of children in the United States that lives less than its parents. We spend $2.2 trillion a year on health care, over five times more than the defense budget. In fact, we pay more per person for health care than any industrialized country in the world. Yet we're sicker than ever. You see, there's no money in healthy people, and there's no money in dead people. The money is in the middle. People who are alive, sort of, but with one or more chronic conditions. Obesity, diabetes, heart disease, high blood pressure are all diet-related health issues that cost this country more than $120 billion each year. Every minute, a person in the U.S. is killed by heart disease. 1,500 people a day die from cancer. Combined, these two diseases kill over 1 million Americans every year. Cases of diabetes are skyrocketing, particularly among our younger population. Diabetes. Diabetes. Life-threatening diabetes. One out of three people born in the U.S. today will develop this crippling condition during their lifetime. Millions of others suffer from a host of degenerative diseases. Millions more of us are so stimulated by sugar, coffee, and energy drinks that we've masked our chronic fatigue. But could there be a single solution to all of these problems? A solution so comprehensive, yet so straightforward, that it's mind-boggling that more of us haven't taken it seriously? Someone has to stand up and say that the answer isn't another pill. The answer is spinach. A growing number of researchers claim that if we eliminate or greatly reduce refined, processed, and animal-based foods, we can prevent, and in certain cases even reverse, several of our worst diseases. They say all we need to do is adopt a whole foods, plant-based diet. It sounds almost too simple to be true. You might not expect someone like me to explore the connection between diet and disease. On my way over, I drank these two Red Bulls. I also had a 12-ounce Coke and another half of a 12-ounce Coke. I haven't always lived the healthiest lifestyle, and I've eaten more than my share of fast food. But as part of my effort to learn more about the link between food and health, I visited two physicians in Los Angeles, Dr. Matt Letterman and Dr. Alona Polday. Hi. How are you doing? Lee, Polday. Nice to meet you. Nice, nice to meet you, too. too. This is Dr. Polday. Hi, Dr. Polday. Pleasure to meet you, too. Both are MDs. Dr. Letterman was trained in internal medicine and Dr. Polday in family practice. They incorporate a whole plant foods nutrition plan into the treatment of their patients. Okay. Let's get started on that, and then All we'll right. do some talking. 142.82. I found out a lot more than I expected. Like a lot of Americans, 
I thought my health was pretty good. I had no major diseases that I knew of. But I hadn't had a thorough checkup in a while, so I decided to get one. When Dr. Letterman gave me the results, it was a real wake-up call. I gotta say, I'm kind of shocked. I'm really worried about my blood work numbers. Uh, 240 and 241 for my cholesterol is way higher than it's ever been. I got this six number. That to me is the most worrying number I got. The six number was the result of something called a CRP test, which measures the inflammation in my heart and blood vessels. This put me in the high risk category for a heart attack. So I committed to a 12 week nutrition program under Dr. Letterman's supervision. The plan was to treat my health problems by eating a whole foods, plant-based diet. The idea of using nutrition to promote good health is nothing new. Indeed, Hippocrates, the ancient Greek father of Western medicine, said, let food be thy medicine over 2,000 years ago. Yet it wasn't until more recently that the science behind this observation was systematically probed and applied. Two researchers who've made groundbreaking contributions to this effort are Dr. Colin Campbell and Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn. Born just a few months apart in 1933 and 34, they each grew up on farms. Campbell's childhood farm is in rural Virginia, where his family raised dairy cattle and milked cows. My dad and mother moved here in 1943 when I was nine years old. And during that time, we had a dairy of about somewhere between 20 and 30 cows, which in those days was a modest, medium-sized dairy. At the time, milk was believed to be nature's perfect food. So perfect, in fact, that this U.S. government film from the early 20th century recommended that infants who have just been weaned from their mother's milk should be switched immediately to cow's milk. That was the excitement of doing something, producing nature's perfect food, if you will. Established in 1675, the Esselstyn's farm is in upstate New York. On these rolling hillsides, they grazed both beef and dairy cattle. This was yeah. sort of like the nerve center of the operation in a way? More or less, absolutely. This is sort of the, the epicenter around these barns. This is the way farming was, uh, was done in that area. And so this is sort of where you learned the, 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 the craft trade. of the trade <laughs> of farming. How old were you when you moved here again? Uh, seven. I didn't start driving the tractor until I was eight years old. <laughs> well, a late, a late bloomer, right? Yes. <laughs> exactly. But I enjoyed it, and I, I really got a great kick out of doing the farm work. Although they didn't know each other yet, farm life had a deep and lasting influence on both Campbell and Esselstyn. To make it successful, you had to have persistent staying power and tenacity of purpose. I guess it's ironic in the sense that we're both now advocating, not consuming the products that we were busy actually producing with our families. During Campbell and Esselstyn's lifetimes, the American diet has changed dramatically. Near the beginning of the 20th century, Americans each ate about 120 pounds of meat annually. By 2007, that figure had exploded to no less than 222 pounds. In 1913, we ate about 40 pounds of processed sugar each per year. However, by 1999, our consumption of all refined sweeteners had risen to over 147 pounds. In 1909, Americans consumed around 294 pounds of dairy products apiece. But by 2006, our yearly intake of dairy had more than doubled to 605 pounds. By the early 1950s, Campbell was off to college at Penn State, while Esselstyn went to Yale. As part of Yale's rowing team, Esselstyn won an Olympic gold medal in 1956. During this same decade, the pace of American life was accelerating, even with our food. The late 50s was the heyday of the drive-in burger joint. The supermarket was just beginning to thrive in the newly built post-World War II suburbs. This was when the so-called convenience foods were born, like the legendary foil wrap TV dinner, not to mention a host of other tasty processed delicacies devised to make our lives easier and better.
By now, Colin Campbell was in graduate school at Cornell University, which had one of the most prestigious nutritional science departments in the country. His research was on animal nutrition and biochemistry. But it was focused more on feeding animals for their ability to be able to produce meat, milk, and eggs, protein containing. And so my own research was focused on protein, making sure we got enough. It was considered to be the vital nutrient. It was one of the first nutrients discovered. And without protein, the animal would die. So it was a life force. And in fact, in even the early uh, 1900s, uh, there were statements made that this is the stuff of civilization itself. Protein was also nearly synonymous with animal-based foods like meat. It still is today, all over America. Why do you think meat is important in our diet? Protein. 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 A lot of protein. We need protein, don't we? We can't live without protein. The idea that plants had protein also uh, didn't come into play until maybe the late 1800s, early 1900s, and then it struggled through the years. No matter what source the protein came from, in the late 1950s, most scientists believed the world needed a lot more of it. We had a lot of starving and malnourished children in the world. And so in my community, in the nutrition community, there were discussions about why so, you know, what could be done. And one of the prominent thoughts was to make sure they get enough protein. I certainly went along with this view. At about the same time, Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn was just beginning his medical career at the world-famous Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, Ohio. Surgery soon became his specialty. There's something awfully satisfying about if you can remove the disease. For instance, if a patient had gallstones, you could remove them. If it was a gastric ulcer or a stomach ulcer, you'd directly take care of that. If it's a hernia, the same thing. During the 1960s, heart disease was on the rise in the U.S. What doctors commonly call coronary artery disease is usually caused by a condition of the arteries that supply the heart with blood. What happens is that over time, a fatty substance in the bloodstream called cholesterol builds up in the coronary arteries, restricting the blood flow to the heart. This can ultimately cause several problems, from severe chest pain called angina to heart attacks. Cholesterol is a natural substance produced by all animals, including humans, and it's an essential component of our cell's walls. But when we consume dietary cholesterol, which is only found in animal foods like meat, eggs, and dairy products, it tends to stay in the bloodstream. This so-called plaque is what collects on the inside of our blood vessels and is the major cause of coronary artery disease. In the late 1960s, a colleague of Dr. Esselstyn's at the Cleveland Clinic made a major breakthrough in the treatment of this condition. In fact, Esselstyn shared space with him in the clinic's surgical locker room. His name was Dr. Rene Favolaro. Rene really sparkled in the operating room, and in 1967, he did his first bypass graft at the uh, clinic, coronary artery bypass graft. This revolutionary new procedure was accomplished by removing a vein from the patient's leg then stitching it on the heart's blocked coronary artery to allow the blood to flow around or bypass the blockage. Today, over 500,000 Americans go under the knife annually for heart bypass surgery, costing around $100,000 a piece. These operations alone constitute a staggering total of nearly $50 billion. Joey Acoin lives in Tampa, Florida, where he owns and operates a landscaping company. I tell everybody to joke with everybody with me as, I don't eat to live, I live to eat. And I, my whole life I ate whatever I wanted. In 2004, doctors discovered Joey had a dangerously high cholesterol level of 320 and a hazardous blood sugar level of 480. This not only made him a type two diabetic, but a prime candidate for a heart attack and a stroke. And this is my daily pill regimen. Um, I got two pills I take for my diabetes, then I got one for cholesterol, one for high blood pressure, and then I take Bieta, which is an injectable medicine, every morning before breakfast and every night before dinner. And that's what I've been doing for almost four years now. 
and I know it makes me tired and I just, I just don't feel normal. I only sleep four hours a night or so. I just hate taking them. In the mid 1960s, Dr. Campbell was in the Philippines trying to get more protein to millions of malnourished children. To keep costs down, he and his colleagues decided not to use animal-based protein. The program was beginning to show success. But then Dr. Campbell stumbled onto a piece of information that was extremely important. It centered on the more affluent families in the Philippines, who were eating relatively high amounts of animal-based foods. But at the same time, they were the ones most likely to have the children who were susceptible to getting liver cancer. This was very unusual, since liver cancers are mainly found in adults. But just the mere fact that they occurred in children said, you know, there's something here. This is pretty significant. Shortly afterward, Dr. Campbell came across a scientific paper published in a little-known Indian medical journal. It detailed work that had been done on a population of experimental rats that were first exposed to a carcinogen called aflatoxin, then fed a diet of casein, the main protein found in milk. They were testing the effect of protein on the development of liver cancer. They used two different levels of protein. They used 20% of total calories, and then they used a much lower level, 5%. 20% turned on cancer, 5% turned it off. This Indian paper, together with what Dr. Campbell had learned about increased liver cancers in children eating animal-based foods, combined to create a decisive moment in his work and his life because we learned that animal protein was really good in turning on cancer. During the same time, the way Americans ate was changing again. The number of fast food franchises was exploding as more and more overscheduled Americans began using them as a convenient way to feed themselves and their families. While the fast food revolution was sweeping the nation, the rate of cancer deaths in America was continuing to rise. As a result, in 1971, President Richard Nixon initiated a program that was dubbed the War on Cancer. We are here today for the purpose of signing the Cancer Act of 1971. And I hope that in the years ahead that we may look back on this day and this action as being the most significant action taken during this administration. On the front lines of this new war was Caldwell Esselstyn. By 1978, he was chairman of the Breast Cancer Task Force at the Cleveland Clinic. Yet he soon began to doubt the medical procedures he was using. No matter how many of these operations I was doing for women for breast cancer, I wasn't doing one single thing for the next unsuspecting victim. So Dr. Esselstyn started investigating the global statistics on breast cancer. One of the facts he discovered was that the incidence of breast cancer in Kenya was far lower than it was in the United States. In fact, in 1978, the chances of a woman getting breast cancer in Kenya were 82 times lower than in the U.S. Dr. Esselstyn was even more surprised by the numbers he discovered for some other types of cancer. In the entire nation of Japan in 1958, how many autopsy-proven deaths were there from cancer of the prostate? 18. 18 in the entire nation. That, to me, was about the most mind-boggling public health figure that I, I think I'd ever encountered. In the same year, the U.S. population was only about twice the size of Japan's, yet the number of prostate cancer deaths exceeded 14,000. Dr. Esselstyn also discovered that in the early 1970s, the risk for heart disease in rural China was 12 times lower than it was in the U.S. And in the highlands of Papua New Guinea, heart disease was rarely encountered. The link he noted between all the areas he studied was simple. Virtually, the Western diet was non-existent. They had no animal products. They had no dairy, no meat. Even more compelling to Esselstyn was some historical data that had long been overlooked. In World War II, the Germans occupied Norway. Among the first things they did was confiscate all the livestock and farm animals to provide supplies for their own troops. So the Norwegians were forced to eat mainly plant-based foods. Now we look at the deaths in Norway, just antecedent to this period, from heart attack and stroke. 19 
27, 1930, 35. Look at right up here, right at the very top, 1939. Bingo! In come the Germans. Immediately, 1940, wow, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45. Have we ever seen a population have their cardiovascular disease plummet like this from statins, from bypass surgery, or from stents? No. But look what immediately happened. With the cessation of hostilities in 1945, back comes the meat, back comes the dairy, back comes the strokes and heart attacks. I mean, it's such an absolute powerful lesson, but uh, we didn't get it. Because of evidence like this, Dr. Esselstyn was making the same assessment that Dr. Campbell was due to his work in the Philippines, seeing a causal link between animal-based foods and some of our most deadly diseases. But they weren't the only researchers coming to this conclusion. Another was Dr. John McDougall. In the mid-1970s, he began practicing on a sugar plantation in Hawaii. What uh, I observed there was the health of the people differed dramatically depending upon how long they'd been in Hawaii. People who were raised in Japan, the Philippines, Korea, China, first generation, who had moved from their native land were always trim never had heart disease, prostate cancer, colon cancer, breast cancer, rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, never overweight. They were in their 80s and 90s and fully functional. Their kids got a little fatter, a little sicker. Their grandkids and the next generation were just as fat and sick as anybody I'd ever seen. And what came through clearly was the diet was the difference. The first generation had learned a diet of rice and vegetables in their native land. But the kids, they started to give up the rice and replace it with the animal foods, the, the dairy products, the meats. And the results were obvious. They got fat and sick. So I knew at that point what caused most diseases. At the time, however, Campbell and Esselstyn knew virtually nothing about this other information. Even so, they ultimately reached a revolutionary conclusion that many of our most crippling conditions could be greatly reduced, if not completely eradicated, simply by eating what they call a whole foods, plant-based diet. This means consuming foods that come mainly from whole, minimally refined plants, such as fruits, vegetables, grains, and legumes. It also means avoiding animal-based foods, such as meat, dairy, and eggs, as well as processed foods, like bleached flour, refined sugars, and oil. Campbell and Esselstyn's research in this field would change their lives forever. went through your preliminary form, the goals that I have, tell me if I'm missing any from you, were eliminate your shots in medicines. You want to get off this stuff. You want to sleep well at night. You're not doing that. You want to stop feeling tired and run down. You want to lose weight. That's it. You got That's it. it. Those are your goals. The other complaints, you had low energy, ringing in the ears, sinus problems, post-nasal drip, shortness of breath, wheezing, coughs, indigestion and reflux, loose stool, diarrhea, bloating, black and bloody mucusy stool with meat consumption and difficulty walking, getting around, trouble losing weight, chronic and unpleasant hunger feelings, groggy after meals, strong food cravings, and anxiety about food in general. All of that stuff. Sounds like I'm dead. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't mean to, you know, harp on the, the bad yeah. stuff, but, you know, that, that will all, most of that should get better. My goals I'm adding in. Which goals do you I add I want in? you to reverse all your medical diseases, the ones that we can reverse, and most of yours we could. I told you all the risk and benefit mm -hmm. based on what I told you. I would stop all these meds and I would stop these on top of all these okay, risks. Okay, that's what I'm going to try. You're going to get my best, my best effort, I can tell you that. Yeah, yeah you'll, do, you'll do good. Okay. You'll, do, you'll do well. By 1975, Dr. Campbell was at Cornell University investigating what he discovered in the Philippines. Our work from the beginning was designed, to, in a sense, to do two main things. One, I wanted to replicate, if possible, the Indian work because it was so provocative. Secondly, if this is really true, I wanted to study how does it work. Just like the Indian researchers, Campbell fed half the rats in his study a diet of 20% casein, the main protein in dairy products. The other half was fed only 5% casein. 
Over the 12 weeks of the study, the rats eating the higher protein diet had a greatly enhanced level of early liver cancer tumor growth. On the other hand, all of the rats eating only 5% protein had no evidence of cancer whatsoever. But Dr. Campbell decided to take these findings a step further. This time, instead of keeping his test rats on the same diet throughout the study, he kept them in one group and switched their diets back and forth between 5 and 20% dairy protein, doing so at three-week intervals. The results were astonishing. Whenever the rats were fed 20% protein, early liver tumor growth exploded. But when the same rats were given 5% protein, tumor growth actually went down. I mean, this was so provocative, this information. We could turn on and turn off cancer growth just by adjusting the level of intake of that protein. Going from 5% to 20% is within the range of American experience. The typical studies on chemical carcinogens causing cancer are testing chemicals at levels maybe three or four orders of magnitude higher than we experience. Even more surprisingly, Dr. Campbell discovered that a 20% diet of plant proteins from soybeans and wheat did not promote cancer. <laughs> However, there's a long-standing belief among the public that animal protein is important for human health. Connie Dickman supports this position. Ms. Dickman is Director of Nutrition at Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri. She's the past president of the American Dietetic Association and an advisor to the National Dairy Council. When you eliminate animal foods from your eating plan, you run the risk of inadequate protein content. Animal proteins provide all the amino acids that we need for cell growth, tissue repair, and overall health. Eating whole fruits, it's uh, virtually impossible to be protein deficient without being calorie deficient because even if you take the foods that are the, have the least amount of protein in it, let's say potatoes, for example, or rice, you know, eight, nine percent. Well, isn't that, that's the figure we more or less need. Dr. Campbell's research led him to a conclusion about the way genes, chemicals, and nutrition interact to promote cancer. Cancer starts with genes. It might be genes we're born with. It might be genes that are actually changed by a chemical. So those genes become capable of producing cancer cells. Whether we do or don't get cancer is primarily related to how we promote those cancer cells to grow over time. That's where nutrition comes into play. They go much more rapidly when they were fed animal protein. Dr. Campbell and other nutritional scientists have found that only a small percentage of cancer cases are caused solely by genes. I think the general consensus in my field is that probably not more than one or two percent at most is attributed to the genes we may or may not have. And that's the most helpful and hopeful information I give people. Because if you go through life thinking that what happens to you from a health perspective is based on your genes, you're a helpless victim. My diet was, was pretty abominable. I thought the two principal food groups were caffeine and sugar. I paid Dr. Pam Popper is executive director of the Wellness Forum in Columbus, Ohio, and an expert in the areas of health and nutrition. And you want the women in my family are all overweight. I'm not. I don't eat and live like they do. You know, so I've changed my health destiny by not engaging in the same habits. Over the next several years, Dr. Campbell initiated more extensive lab studies using various animal and plant nutrients. The results were consistent. Nutrients from animal foods promoted cancer growth, while nutrients from plant foods decreased cancer growth. Yet Campbell hadn't identified a specific biological mechanism that caused the effects he observed. And it finally occurred to me that there was no such thing as the mechanism. What we were looking at was a symphony of mechanisms. We think that nutrition is attributed to individual nutrients, and that's the way it gets marketed, and that's the way the companies tell us, so forth. When in fact, nutrition, all of it working together to create this symphony, the hundreds of thousands of different kinds of chemicals and food all kind of work together nicely. I mean, the complexity is total. That's a holistic concept. And I had to say from, to myself, that's a very exciting idea. Dr. Campbell realized that his discoveries in the laboratory were significant but limited. How are these findings relevant in people? How do different types of foods affect cancer and other diseases? 
Campbell needed a large-scale population study. He would soon find a perfect opportunity. So mangoes are really good. They flavor things really Okay. Nice. That's something you want to get a riper one. Dr. Matt Letterman and his wife, Dr. Alona Pulday, are among a small but growing number of physicians who use a whole foods, plant-based diet as a primary treatment for their patients, from shopping with patients to teach them how to read nutrition labels. And I don't care what it says on the front, the back, or the sides. Look at the Look ingredients. Look at the ingredients, okay. and that's all I care about. To showing patients how to prepare meals. They are not your typical MDs. Doctors Letterman and Polday use food as treatment because they feel it's the best medicine available. Medicine that not only makes their patients feel better, but that truly improves their health. In 1973, the U.S. Congress passed a new farm subsidy bill. Among other things, it included incentives that encouraged a massive increase in corn production. One of the major byproducts of this enormous corn surplus was a low-cost sweetener called high fructose corn syrup. Companies could add this sweetener to anything from soda pop to hot dogs, and then make these products widely available at low prices. Processed sugars and other refined foods are far more calorie dense than the whole plants they're made from. The dramatic increase in their use is a major reason why our food has become richer. To evolutionary psychologist and author Dr. Doug Lyle, the consumption of unnaturally dense foods is the main cause for the epidemic of obesity in America. It isn't that people become more self-indulgent. Uh, it isn't because they're, they're lazier than they ever were. What's happening is, is that their mechanisms of satiation are being fooled. The process starts with a range of receptors in our stomachs that help us gauge how much food we've eaten. These include stretch receptors to help measure the sheer volume of food in our stomachs. We also have density receptors to help determine the caloric density, or what we more commonly call the richness of our food. For instance, 500 calories of natural plant food fills the stomach completely, triggering both our stretch and density receptors to signal our brain that we've had enough to eat. But 500 calories of unnaturally rich or processed food fills the stomach far less, deceiving these receptors into telling our brain that we need to eat more. Even worse is 500 calories of oil, which is almost pure fat, and barely triggers any response at all. The problem with weight management in humans is that if you make these foods completely artificial, which we do today, um, you wind up with a problem that people have to overeat just to be satisfied. But why do these concentrated foods that are so harmful to us give us so much pleasure? Dr. Lyle says the answer is related to a system called the motivational triad. This is a trio of biological mechanisms that nature has designed into every creature on Earth so they can survive to pass their genes on to the next generation. The first leg of the motivational triad is pleasure-seeking. And uh, primarily two things are the cause of that, and those two things are food and sex. So in the case of a great white shark, it's basically got a neon sign flashing across its forehead saying food, sex, food, sex, food, sex. Unless it's a male, then it says sex food, sex food, but it's pretty much the same thing. The other two legs of the motivational triad are avoiding pain and doing everything with the least amount of effort. Pleasure seeking, pain avoidance, and energy conservation, that really sums up animal behavior, whether we're talking about a paramecium under a microscope or a great white shark. Richer foods naturally excite our senses because it's nature's way of telling us they will provide the highest amount of dietary reward with the least amount of effort. This helped our ancestors find the most calorie-dense and ripe foods available, which contributed to our survival. But in today's environment, we can artificially increase calorie density well beyond what our ancestors would have found in nature. The resulting foods give us a hypernormal amount of pleasure, leading us into something Dr. Lyle calls the pleasure trap. What the pleasure trap is, is uh, an interaction between our natural instincts, which are trying to tell us the right thing to do, and some kind of artificial modern stimulation that is piggybacking or hijacking that process. So the classic example of the pleasure trap would be drugs and drug addiction. The way drugs work is they hijack 
the existing pleasure circuits. When certain chemicals hit uh, those areas, they cause feelings of euphoria and excitement. The same drug-like effect happens when we eat highly concentrated, processed foods. We've removed the fiber, we've removed the water, we've removed the minerals, we've done everything that we can to hyper-concentrate sugar and fat and add a bunch of salt as well into the food. And now what the food has become is become a low-grade addiction. These things are drugs. They have other deleterious side effects, not the least of which is adding a lot of empty calories. Dr. Terry Mason is Commissioner of Health for the City of Chicago. He's one of the few public officials in America who openly supports a plant-based diet. If it walked, hopped, swam, crawled, slithered, had eyes, a mom and a dad, don't eat it. Dr. Mason contends that the less affluent segments of our population have difficulty making the best food choices. Well, first of all, the diets are calorie rich and nutrient poor. Uh, this is the, the real problem. And unfortunately, poor people are poor in everything. They're poor in health, they're poor in food choices, they're poor in almost every aspect you can think of. This makes the less prosperous particularly vulnerable to the low-grade addiction of highly processed foods. People want stuff that's fast, people want stuff that's quick, and they like the stuff that's salty, and they like the taste of something fried. And so those are the kinds of things that you see in our community. Sandera Nation lives in a quiet suburb in Cleveland, Ohio, with her five children. In October 2008, she was stricken by a strange illness. I want to say something, but it's not coming out. I'm getting really shaky and sweats, and then I'm cold, and I'm sick, and I'm fatigued, and my stomach hurts and everything, so I went to the doctor. And that's when they diagnosed me with hypertension and diabetes. Like Joya Coyne, Sandero was treated with expensive prescription drugs. I was in denial for a while. I heard what they said, but I was in denial, like, hmm. I still ate things I shouldn't have. I didn't really get the education that I needed to know. So I really depended on that pill to save me. Then Sandera met with Dr. Esselstyn, who recommended that she treat her illnesses with a whole foods, plant-based diet. Well, let's, uh, come on in and we'll, we'll get to work. I was a little nervous, um, but he made it real easy for me. I was real interested in what he had to say and what he was going to teach me in the new journey that I would be taking with him. In 1974, Chinese Premier Zhou Enlai was hospitalized with bladder cancer. Knowing that his disease was terminal, he decided to give his country a more complete understanding of cancer. So he initiated what would become one of the largest and most thorough scientific studies in history. 650,000 researchers cataloged the mortality patterns caused by several types of cancer for the years between 1973 and 1975. The study encompassed every county in China and over 880 million people. Zhou died in 1976, years before his study was complete. Okay, and you'll need how many shirts then? Probably three? Yeah. Okay. Zhou and Lai's cancer study would ultimately have a major impact on what Dr. Campbell himself has called the capstone of his research. And you were there for two or three months. Dr. Jun Shi Chen is now senior research professor with the Chinese Center for Disease Control and Prevention. He first met Dr. Campbell at Cornell in 1980, when he was a member of the Chinese Institute of Food and Nutrition Science. The Cold War was just beginning to thaw, and Dr. Chen was among the first senior scientists from China to visit the United States. By then, Dr. Campbell had become one of the most distinguished nutritional biochemists in the world. When they discovered this book, a significant collaboration was born. 
This is the Atlas of Cancer Mortality uh, in China. Published in 1981, the Cancer Atlas was the result of Zhou and Lai's nationwide study. It showed a highly unusual geographical distribution of different types of cancer in China, which tended to be clustered in certain hot spots. The same was true with cancer after cancer, and the counties with the highest levels were often far greater than the counties with the lowest levels. So, for example, esophageal cancer, according to this cancer map, the mortality has 400-fold difference among different counties in China. That's huge. Yeah, and in, I understood that in the United States, only several-fold difference. Uh, maybe, not, not may, may, maybe twofold is another, <laughs> yeah. that's all we see. Yeah, yeah. So that caught our uh, attention in terms of the why. Because they are all Chinese. Genetically, they are all the same. And why they have so much difference in single cancer mortality. So we believe it has to be related to the environment, the big environment. And from our professional perspective, of course, is the diet and the nutrition. Dr. Chen and I he said, you know, why don't we just go there and do a study? For Dr. Campbell, it was the opportunity he'd been looking for. Among other things, he could examine how his observations about liver cancer in Filipino children and the findings from his lab studies applied to a large human population. The project would consider 367 diet and health-related variables, making it one of the most ambitious nutritional studies ever conceived. Dr. Campbell and his associates carefully chose 65 counties scattered across China. These counties were mainly located in rural or semi-rural areas. We use the rural counties because they are stable in their residence and they have been in this lifestyle for at least 20 to 30 years. More than 350 workers were trained. They carefully surveyed the diet and lifestyle of 6,500 people in the chosen counties. Urine and blood samples were also taken. In 1983, Drs. Campbell, Chen, and their collaborators began to analyze the vast amount of information that had been collected. The job would take years. After eight weeks eating plant-based foods, Joya Coyne was still off all his medications. When I started this, I had all these side effects from medication and from my being so unhealthy, but now I'm getting in better, better shape every day. I feel more healthy. I very seldom get tired during the day. I just feel so good all the time. This, this is a scale that I weigh myself on, and it started about eight weeks ago, way up here around 218, 220, and now it's bouncing between 180 and 185. None of my belts fit. This one here, I actually had to have two new holes punched in because I like the belt so much. Nothing fits, I gotta go shopping. It's, it's just everything, all my clothes, a good problem to have. 